it's been a long way to a long time since I since I've been there. I was just reflecting. Last time I was actually in Australia was uh, 2012, and and before that it was 2008. So I haven't kept the same cadence. I think it's about time I I came out to see you guys. I was on uh, I was uh, with Graham Hancock and Mitch Schultz during a tour. Uh, it was just before my book came out. Oh and, yes, yes. Um, that was that the Origins of Consciousness tour. That was that, it. That was yeah, it. The right. Origins in, um, of Consciousness tour. Melbourne, uh, Melbourne University. I think um, was that that event. Yes. Well, there were venues up and down the coast, but that was really a memorable tour for for many, at least for me, and. Uh, yeah, I, I regret not being able to get back there after that, but maybe soon after after travel restrictions lift, maybe I can get out there this year, next year. I've always had a great time when I've been invited. I don't have to tell you, Australia is a wonderful place. You know, the, the people are great. The food is good. <laughs> so it's always been great. <laughs> Um, would, uh, speaking of favourite things from Australia, do you have a favourite plant? Is there a, a particular um, Australian bon botanical um, thing that's your... Well, uh, I, I wouldn't say a favourite plant, but uh, I'm, I'm partial to the acacias. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, as you, and, and I guess the, the generic term is wattle. And as you know, uh, many of these acacias are sources of uh, tryptamine, some of the most potent uh, tryptamine uh, sources in, in the world, actually. And uh, in, in 2017, you have a, you have a uh, self-taught scholar in your organization who you undoubtedly know, Snoo Vogelbrinder. He goes by that name, and he is literally a scholar of these acacias. And when I organized this uh, ethnopharmacologic search for psychoactive drugs symposium in the UK in 2017, we had enough in the budget to bring him out, and he gave a wonderful talk on these acacias, and then published his paper in the in the proceedings. So. If uh, Snoo, if you're in the audience, I'd like to give a shout out to you. Uh, you have a, he's a brilliant man. He does not have academic credentials, but fortunately psychoethnobotany is one of these areas where you don't need credentials. You know, you, you can get very far as a quote unquote amateur. Uh, Sorry, that word again, psychoethnobotany. Or ethnopsychopharmacology or, or, you know, Oh, I like various I, yeah, I, psychoethnopharmacology. I, Let's go with that, <laughs> you know. And and Snoo is a self-taught scholar in this field. He's done the equivalent of three or four PhDs uh, researching these acacias. And uh, so, actually, uh, ethnopharmacologic search for psychoactive drugs. I, I can uh, put in uh, the uh, the website. For that conference, uh, which people can visit in their spare time, ESPD50.com. Yeah, we'll drop that one uh, into the YouTube uh, YouTube chat. Um, yeah. Speaking uh, now, now you've been. I, I mean, how's coronavirus been for you? What has it has it slowed down your projects? I know that there was something, and maybe you can talk to us a little bit about your new project in the Amazon. But uh, yeah, I mean, where's that all at with uh, you know uh, the apocalypse? Well, personally, COVID has been okay for me and my wife. It's just the two of us. We have been distancing uh, and uh, staying indoors as much as possible. But you know, for me, it's weirdly normal because basically I'm in my basement all the time working online anyway. So just another day. The, the difference is that when you go out, you have to be more careful. Uh, so, you know, it hasn't been too bad. 
uh, in that respect. But in terms of the stuff I like to do, and uh, we'll probably get into talking about the McKenna Academy, which is this new nonprofit I've just recently founded about a year ago. And a lot of what we want to do with the McKenna Academy is, of course, do retreats and conferences. It's basically an educational organization. We want to educate people about plant medicines, coevolution, symbiosis, all these good things. And we had four retreats planned to uh, do in the Sacred Valley of Peru this year. All of that's been canceled. Uh, and we don't know when we're going to be able to start doing physical conferences again. So in the meantime, we've pivoted to trying to develop an online presence, a strong online presence, which has always been part of our agenda. This has just forced us to focus on that and hope for the best when it comes to doing other conferences. But, uh, you know, British Columbia has their, you know, I, I immigrated up here about a year ago. They have their act together. I mean, Canada in general has their act together with respect to COVID and British Columbia especially. You know, they have very uh, strong public health program here. And being Canadians, you know, people have a sense of the common good. And so they're willing to cooperate uh, for the common good and stay masked, stay separate, isolated if that's necessary. And because of that, uh, Canada's been able to bring the curve down. Unlike the United States, where if you pay any attention, it's completely out of control you know, right now. I mean, it's the worst country, uh, the U.S. and Brazil. And I think in part it's because despite the lip service paid, you know, American society really doesn't have a strong sense of the common good, you know, and, and Canada's always emphasized the message the Premier Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau is putting out is we're all in this together, you know, and that's a very common sense message. And the U.S. Uh, mindset is like, we're not in this together. Do whatever you damn want, you know, whatever you damn please. And unfortunately, our our president, uh, you know, that's the message that he propagates. So no wonder it's out of control. You know, this is this is not the, uh, you know, it, it's just, that's just the way it is. But you know, it's a reflection of of uh, you know that sort of individual liberty mindset that is going on in the states that seems to be you know how it is so you know unfortunately uh the virus you know as a result of this uh, the u.s has become kind of a pariah in the world uh you know the the eu and canada have both prohibited travel to uh from anyone in the states cannot go there Mexico even has prohibited travel for people from the states. And I think that's likely to continue until they get this thing under control. And that I don't see that happening for at least the rest of the year. One of the experiences that many people have with, um, with various different plants is, the, uh, is an experience of um, uh, interconnectivity. I'm just wondering, what, what do you think... Um, what do the plants have to teach us about what's going on right now? Uh, the other part of this is I've noticed a lot of... I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, as I'm sure a lot of people have been, um, and I've noticed this, this idea has come up in a few different uh, podcasts now, and I think it was actually uh, when you were here in 2012 that was the first time I came across this idea um, and understanding that we've sort of overlaid this individualism onto the, onto the world around us um, and, and said, uh, you know, it's... a uh, 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 it's a it's it's a world of a survival of the fittest. It's always about whoever can can survive and, and be the most almost ruthless, uh, and that's how our, our yeah. capitalist system works. But now we're finding that actually below the surface uh, things are much more interconnected. Um, yeah, what do the plants have yes, to teach us about this moment? That's right, and, and I think that's one of the uh, one of the main lessons. One of the main. Uh, take home lessons that we can learn from the plant medicines because for some reason they uh 
you know, they help us become aware, as you say, of the interconnectedness of all living things. And this is a wake up call to our species. You know, and, and this is uh, this is always what I say. We're engaged in a co-evolutionary process, but implicit in the in the notion of co-evolution is cooperation and symbiosis, and the challenges that face our planet. Um, uh, you know, in the environmental crisis, is basically because we've forgotten this. You know, that we are participants in this co-evolutionary process, and that. You know, we need to wake up. We need to learn how to get along with all sentient species and, and direct our energy toward the preservation of, of balance and harmony on the global scale. It's now completely out of, out of balance. And this is basically because we've been poisoned by a number of assumptions in the Western mindset, basically you know, whether it comes from the Abrahamic religions or even earlier sources, but the idea that, you know, we're not part of nature and we own it. it. It exists for us to dominate and exploit and ultimately destroy, you know, and we're, we're well along in that process. And I think the plant medicines to those that are privileged enough and lucky enough <clears throat> to be able to have these psychedelic experiences, I think the message comes through loud and clear that no, in fact, you monkeys are not in control. You know, you're not running things. Mostly the plants are running things, you know, because of their ability to photosynthesize. And that's what sustains life on earth. That brings cosmic energy into the biosphere and, and this miracle of photosynthesis enables plants to make complex organic compounds from carbon dioxide and water using sunlight as a as a as a catalyst and create the vast array of uh, organic compounds that we find in plants and that basically is those are the molecules of life and we owe plants this and uh but you know i think actually the lesson to be drawn from the COVID virus is simply this, you know, if you haven't been listening to the plant medicines or you forgot their lesson, COVID comes along and says, oh, this is a reminder, you're not the boss, right? We humans are not the boss, nature is running the show. And nature in the form of the virus is uh, kind of kicking us upside the head you know, and saying the message is pay attention. And also, you know, I, I think the message to the human species in some way is slow down. We have to look for more sustainable ways to live on this planet because, you know, the, 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 it, all of the homeostatic mechanisms that keep things in balance are seriously strained right now and have been for the last 30 years. 30 years ago, we knew this was coming. You know, 30 years ago, we had the luxury of thinking, well, it won't be, you know, it'll be a while. We don't have to worry about this. Well, guess what? Here we are. And we don't have 30 years. We have maybe 10 years, if we're lucky, maybe a little longer than that. So. You know, I, I think I, I do, I am a believer in, in sort of the Gaia hypothesis and the idea that the community of planetary species is an intelligent uh, super organism, you might call it. There's a term in biology for that. And it will do what it needs to do to preserve itself. And so, you know, what we're, uh, what we're seeing is essentially a, mess, a message from Gaia that you know the planet is in great danger and we as a species are in great danger if we don't uh, change our act as it were so uh, one, one of the main projects you've been working on as you mentioned before is the uh, mckenna academy um can you talk to us a little bit about um what your sort of uh, goals are with the uh, uh mckenna uh, academy and and uh what you've been doing lately with the uh with the webinars sure um yeah, the McKenna Academy is a, a concept I had 
for some years. Uh, I'm basically an academic at heart. I'm a teacher. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've been in academia. I've been in academia as what some may consider I was a failed academic, you know, because I never got tenure and I never became, you know, high up in the academic hierarchy. Uh, and so in that sense, but it was, it was a game that I didn't want to play. You know, uh, the, the thing I enjoyed about uh, academia was teaching and imparting information and, and learning from just extremely bright students. You know, and that's been the pleasure for me all along. And so my idea to uh, create an academy is essentially it's a place for learning and about psychedelics, about plant medicine, but also about, you know, other aspects of biology of early life, like symbiosis and that sort of thing. So uh, so I decided to start this academy as, as a way to where people who resonate to that message, who may not be that happy in an academic, you know, conventional academic environment, can find a place to learn that speaks to them. The idea is that the historical precedent for the McKenna Academy, in my mind, it's called the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy. Natural philosophy is what science used to be before it became entirely quantitative and reductionist. Natural philosophy admits that there are different ways of knowing, other ways of knowing. It respects science, but it also recognizes the limitations. And the historical uh, precedent for the McKenna Academy, as I conceive it, is actually the mystery school at Eleusis, which was one of the longest lived of the many mystery schools that existed in the Mediterranean uh, up till about 500 AD. These were psychedelic communities and they were very much in, they were matriarchal. It was all about the divine feminine. It was about the association and symbiosis with living things. So the Academy likes to uh, identify with, with those pre predecessors in its roots in its in its roots and the history and the contemporary analog are are places like Esalen in California or uh, Hollyhock Retreat Center in British Columbia. Of course, these places have been around for years and they're very successful. But that's kind of what we aspire to. We uh, want the academy to be a place where people can bring their best ideas and combined together in a learning community. Uh, so that's the idea. And also, you know, what's necessary is there has to be a huge shift in consciousness if we're gonna, if we're going to essentially avert the global train wreck that's already happening. And it, you know, it may be too late, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be trying. So this is a, a place to to discuss that and what might be done and develop new paradigms for relationships with nature and ourselves and like that. Very open-ended agenda, really. <laughs> well, it's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's certainly a time for, for shifting and changing because uh, the entire way that our, our, our communicative strata of the world uh, it, and everything that that falls on from uh, works is is being uh, upended, and um, you know, I mean, that's just on the on the technical side of things. And then we're finding out new stuff about uh, about plants, and um, there are, I mean, the the. Uh, can you talk to us about um, a project in the Amazon rainforest uh, where um, you're looking to protect uh, some of the plants and find uh, new medicines essentially um yes um that is uh, that's just one of several things the mckenna academy wants to do or or i want to do under that umbrella um you know as you know i've worked in the amazon off and on since 1981 uh, i've been privileged to work with some amazing scientists down there 
And uh, the project I have going right now that uh, so we're, you know, it's, it's something I've aspired to do for a long time. But now it seems like it's going to happen, not least of which we have secured a bit of financial support to get the uh, phase one off the ground. I call it roughly the uh, the UNAP Knowledge Preservation Project. And uh, it ha UNAP is the uh, Universidad Nacional Amazonia de la Peruana in Iquitos, Peru, which is right in the heart of the Peruvian Amazon. And there's an amazing botanist that I've worked there ever since I first came there as a graduate student in 1981. His name is Juan Ruiz. And when I first came there, he was simply a student. He was a forestry student. I was there to do collections and he was uh, assigned to me as uh, to get me into the field and probably get me back alive. Hope, well, obviously he succeeded. But, you know, the, uh, the director of the herbarium at the time, another, another botanist named Franklin Ayala, uh, Juan was his student at the time. And, and now Juan, Franklin Ayala has gone on to do other things, but Juan is actually the curator of the herbarium. And he has incredible knowledge from both theoretically, he's, he's the rare person who's got one foot in science and one foot in traditional medicine. He bridges these two areas. And he has incredible knowledge just accumulated from his long years of work in the field and now in the herbarium. He is one of the people about which Mark Plotkin once remarked, when a medicine man dies, it's as though a library has burned down. Well, Juan is not a medicine man. He would never say he's a medicine man, but he knows a lot of traditional medicine. I believe his father was a, a curandero. And he's gone the science route, but of course he's aware of the importance of natural medicines and the tradition and so on. But he never writes anything down. This is the thing. It's all in his head. And uh, when he goes, all that knowledge will be lost. So what we're trying to do is work on a project with him to document what he knows. That's, that's phase one, is to just spend some time with Juan in the field and in the herbarium, have some excellent videographers, which we already have, uh, to, to sit with him and talk to him about what he knows. So whether it's plants that he's interested in or experiences that he's had, you know, you don't spend the kind of time that he has in the, in the Amazon without having lots of stories to tell. And he certainly does, you know, he's been everywhere, worked with uh, famous botanists like Ari Schultes and uh, Al Gentry and other people that, you know, are known in the botanical field, maybe not to the wider world. But so he is a national treasure. Juan is essentially a national treasure and he's not getting any younger. In fact, I was quite alarmed because, uh, you know, COVID is... Uh, it's devastating Peru. It's getting a little better now, but particularly in the Amazon, it's really bad. And Juan got COVID and was able to cure himself with uh, natural medicines. Um, his sister, his older sister got COVID. She was not so lucky, she died. And a colleague of his at the university died. So. Very important, number one, that Juan stays healthy, and number two, that we try to codify, record somehow his, his knowledge in the form of videos and transcripts of interviews and that sort of thing. That's phase one. And then we hope to leverage that information. If, if we only accomplish phase one, that will be fine. We can stop there. But what we hope to do is leverage that information to write a bigger grant for phase two, which has to do with uh, digitizing the herbarium amazonensis, and uh, this herbarium at uh, UNAP that, that one curates, and putting that resource online, digitize all these images of the herbarium specimens, 
link them into geographic data, genomic databases, all sorts of other uh, information resources relevant to the plant, and then just create that as an open-ended, open source resource for anyone with an interest in Amazonian botany or, or biology or so on, and just make, make this resource available. And thereby, hopefully, uh, uh, you know, create incentives to slow down this decimation of the of the rainforest. It's not as far along in in Peru as it is in Brazil, but it still is proceeding. So it's important. This is something that we can do. Anytime you can associate a piece of information with a plant. It may be good for this or that, and or has different properties. I mean, all plants have intrinsic value, I, I think. I mean, I think it was Walt Whitman who said, a weed is a plant whose virtue has not yet been recognized. You know, I mean, there's no such thing as a weed. They all have a role. They're all amazing. But some have incredible medicinal properties and other properties. And, and the herbaria are libraries of plant collections, as you know. And the UNAP herbarium, which, uh, you know, I first encountered when I went there as a graduate student, it's come a long way since then. The Missouri Botanical Garden has uh, affiliated, has been affiliated with it for about 20 years. And they actually built a new building for it. And uh, uh, I remember when I first went there in 1981, it was in a wooden building close to the main campus with uh, gas fired plant dryers in the back where they were drying their specimens. I was terrified that the thing was gonna burn down, you know, but somehow it survived and now it's in a much better, much better building. It's still a, you know, it, it hasn't reached its potential, but at least the specimens are safe for now. We want to expand those collections. It has 100,000 specimens. 75,000 of them are not yet mounted. So that's a big uh, task that we have to do is get those specimens mounted, then make these high resolution scans. This will be, and I hope that the Missouri Botanical Garden and, and other uh, botanical gardens, possibly the National Science Foundation as well, will fund a, a project to do phase two, which would be a, you know, two to three year project that will probably cost, uh, you know, north of a million dollars. Uh, but as, as these things go, I don't think that's a huge amount. And considering how important this resource is, that it not be lost, I think it's a a reasonable time uh, price tag. So that's going to be a lot of the McKenna Academy's focus uh, over the next couple of years. But then we also, because we've been forced to, uh, we're trying to develop different virtual events. <clears throat> uh, a lot of what our agenda is, is to, uh, uh, you know, to do conferences, to do retreats, different educational type things well we don't have the option to do them in person uh, where we like to do it is in the sacred valley of peru and right now that's not, not an option so we've been trying to develop uh, an online presence we've done a couple of virtual events and we intend to do some more uh, and 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 uh, you know the the virtual events that we've done have really opened my eyes to the potential of, of these virtual, you know, you can reach a lot more people virtually than you can if you organize a conference that people have to come to. Well, and the accessibility as well um, is one thing. I work at a lot of uh, music festivals, and one of the uh, one of the big issues uh, for people that do have uh, accessibility issues is you can't get there. People can't get to it. People can't get to conferences, and not just uh, mobility accessibility, but the cost of a lot of conferences uh, to yes. go to is just out. You know, some, it's beyond what most people are able to. Um, so having these sorts of spaces. Uh, just opens that up and uh, gives so many more people access, which I think um, 
uh, I mean, a lot of people are sort of grasping, what do I do with this now, uh, now that we're, uh, we're all in this online space and um, internet's getting better and better and we can do more and more on it. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come through on the, um, on the YouTube uh, channel. Um, Mira, Mira Mimuse uh, wanted to know about the link between microdosing and neurogenesis, but maybe you could talk to us um, a bit about that, but also about uh, any sort of um, anything that's got you excited in the ethnobotanical world. If there's a plant out there that you think might have uh, some some potential to help with um, psychiatric uh, issues or, or um, something that needs more looking at that's only just on the radar now. Okay, okay. Well, um, yeah, microdosing, um, microdosing seems like it's all the rage now. Uh, everybody wants to microdose and a lot of a lot of these psychedelic startups are basing their, their hopes on that. Uh, I think the, uh, you know, what what microdosing needs is a well controlled study, you know, and there are a couple underway to show that there is actually a benefit. Uh, and, and right now, that doesn't really exist. It's an assumption and anecdotal information that microdosing, uh, you know, has, has some benefits. It may well, but, you know, this is science, not, uh, not superstition. So, you know, we should, we should uh, encourage a, a well-controlled study of microdosing. And then the question is, well, what medicine do you microdose with? Where, where do you get the, the maximum benefit? Of course, everyone is uh, focused on psilocybin. Uh, that seems to be the, the new superstar of the kind of legitimate psychedelic science. But there are others as well. I think that uh, there is actually one group in Peru that's producing uh, uh, various uh, different uh, uh, essentially freeze-dried uh, preparations of different preparations of ayahuasca and using those for microdosing. Uh, again, all of this is completely untested in terms of actual evidence, but it's reasonable to suppose that they too would, stimu would stimulate uh, cognition, cognitive improvements, and in the case of ayahuasca, of course, you're probably aware of recent uh, research that shows that harmine uh, is much more than just an MAO inhibitor, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor in ayahuasca. It has other effects as well. One of those effects is it does stimulate neurogenesis and uh, in the hippocampus. Psilocybin may well do this as well, but I don't think it's been proven. Uh, so... Uh, you know, I think like with anything related to psychedelics, you should approach it carefully, thoughtfully, and you should approach it from an informed standby standpoint. So there's plenty of information out there about microdosing. And if you intend to do it, more power to you. Just know what you're doing before you go into it. So that's, uh, that's, that's my thought. That's the, yeah, um, yeah. No, that's that's good. I, the I rest think, of it, I forgot. What was the rest of the question? Oh, no, I I think that that's um, you know one of the things uh, as uh, the the psychedelic renaissance has sort of been going on for the past, uh, especially the past decade, uh, is that the, it's almost like the excitement over that has outpaced mm. where the uh, where the science and research is at, and the sort of uh, rumor mill or the uh, the the hope mill uh, starts uh, starts churning over, and people start to convince themselves that something is definitely so when actually the the research is still out and um uh like i mean i've tried uh, things like microdosing mushrooms i, I didn't personally notice a, a whole whole lot other people swear by it my partner swears by uh, mm -hmm. uh doing that sort of thing so i'm just like well you know i'm i'm not sure then it's not really clear and that's you know that's why we have you on to to help uh clarify these uh these sorts of um sorts of issues um, yeah, I, th I think I think microdosing may well have benefits. I'm not saying that it doesn't. What I would like to see, though, is the, a good study. What what I've seen now, I mean, it, there are surveys, you know, uh, that have been done about microdosing, but those are hardly controlled experiments. Those are basically accumulations of anecdotes, and and that's fine. It's information. It's not a 
you know, definitive uh, study, the placebo controlled and all that that shows their benefits for microdosing. But it, it is what it is. It goes as far as it does. Maybe this I is would gonna... urge people to remember, though, that uh, microdosing is one application of psychedelics. But don't forget, just around the corner is a world of wonder. And I think that people should take care and make sure that they take a full dose of a psychedelic once in a while, because it'll be worth your while. Let's put it that way. You will definitely learn things from that that you might not learn from microdosing. But one of the things that I've um, noticed about the, the sort of psychedelic uh, renaissance and the excitement over things like that is, um, and I, I suppose this comes from the medicalization of cannabis sort of movement, we have this mm -hmm. idea that a legitimate use of uh, one of these plant medicines uh, has to be for uh, some kind of ailment, something that ails us, we've got a mental issue, we need to... But I think the reality is for a lot of people when it, when it, when it comes down to it that... They just enjoy it, um, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Do you think we need to get back onto just that being okay? Do you think that there's a a problem with the um, focus on legitimate legitimate use being only within a medical context and only when you're uh, when you're considered you know below um, standard health or something? Is this, this sort of framework? Um, no, no, I completely uh, disagree with that. You know, I think that, uh, I mean, I think they definitely have medical applications, right? And for many people with these disorders like intractable depression, PTSD, addictions, and so on, psychedelics can be a tremendous boon. But we need to remember that, uh, you know, they can also be used for the what, what Bob Jesse has called the betterment of the well, you know, these are learning tools and people say, well, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't use them recreationally. I'm not sure what the problem is with that. If you use them carefully and recreationally, you can benefit from them. I mean, one man's recreation is perhaps another man's profound mystical experience. So rather than tell people how to use them, I think what we should do is urge people to use them to educate themselves about the medicines, the appropriate way to use them, and then make their own choices, you know, but make their choices based on good information. And I, I think, uh, you know, I mean, we, we, we've been in association with psychedelics for, you know, how long? 20,000 years, probably. We didn't have an FDA until, you know, the beginning of the uh, 19th century, even before that. We didn't have this regulatory framework. We had what we had was a cultural context for the use of psychedelics, mostly shamanism. And that, you know, if, if we want to use psychedelics effectively in medicine, I think we need to look back at shamanism and actually probably... Uh, seek you know ceremony and a well uh constructed set and setting you know with psychedelics they always talk about the set and setting it's very important that you have that it does not have to be a traditional shamanic set and setting but it you know some combination of psychotherapy and a shamanic approach is probably the way to go and again realizing that people will invent their own ways of using these things important thing is that they use it respectfully and for benefit these are tools for exploring consciousness you know I, i've been uh, i've been reading uh, i've been rereading my brother's book the food of the gods because uh uh some it's actually going to come out in a new edition this fall and they they asked me to write a foreword so i thought i should go back and read it but uh, toward the end of the book, he suggests these things should be called consciousness expanding drugs, which is what they used to be called back in the day. And somehow that's gone away, that notion. Now we call them psychedelics or entheogens or, you know, mysticomimetics or psychotomimetics. <laughs> uh, I think psychedelic is a good word, but we could also call them consciousness expanding medicines. 
you know. Well, that... and um, this is a this is a question from the uh, YouTube comments, but it's following on from this. Um, I mean, we yeah, we have the the consciousness expanding part, but do you think that psychedelic culture overall uh, is heading in the right direction? Are there some dark sides uh, that you have seen? Um, it's mainstream now. Psychedelic. There are psychedelic references in uh, big pop culture movies and Hollywood movies. People will talk about these things openly, even though we still live under prohibition across the world. Um, other yeah. than those few little pockets of uh, research, uh, and and sometimes you'll get things like the uh, the exemptions in the U.S. for the um, uh, Native American churches to use uh, mescaline. Um, so you've got these kind of little pockets, but overall we're still under prohibition, but there's been this rise in psychedelic culture. Is it heading the right direction? Well, you know, yes, I think so. It's a mixed bag, right? I mean, any time you have a powerful spiritual technology, you know, and that's really what psychedelics are. They're a spiritual technology that enable people to get in touch with themselves, with other people, and with nature, any any sp powerful spiritual technology is also prone to being misused. You know, it can be misused. It can be used with people who want to use it for power, for example. Uh, you know, it's not limited to psychedelics. Any kind of cult-like situation is a temptation to misuse the power that you're that you're manipulating in a, in a, for personal power, it requires a moral compass. It requires ethical clarity to use these things well, to use them correctly and in a, in a beneficial way. You're always going to have that, you know, uh, and, and it, it, it really is about personal responsibility, how you choose to use them and awareness that, you know, I, I mean, I often say that, there's no such thing as a bad drug, you know, but there's plenty of bad ways to use drugs. And that's an important distinction. In other words, the moral quality of our behavior comes from within our hearts. The technology that we utilize is not important. It can be abused or misused or used beneficially. So the focus should be on our behavior and how we relate to these things. On one level, I'm happy to see all this research. I'm happy to see, uh, uh, you know, psychedelics becoming legitimized, if we want to use that term. I mean, they were never illegitimate, but they were prohibited. So I'm happy to see things change as the medical community begins to wake up to the fact that, you know, they do have benefits. I do not think that they should be co-opted by the medical community. I think that, I actually think that people, uh, you know, if you have a situation where you need psychedelic treatment and you want to go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist who's trained in using psychedelics, that's great. But you shouldn't assume that that's the only beneficial way to use them. And I think that people, particularly with respect to the plant medicines and the fungal medicines, they should have access to those. And it, it does not do to, uh, in my opinion, it doesn't do to approve something like psilocybin, you know, for medical use and say that is allowed, you know, because that fits into the medical, you know, the regulatory framework. But this guy over here who wants to go uh, out into a field and pick mushrooms and eat them, he's going to get arrested. That makes no sense. I think uh, we, I think we in the ethnobotanical community have to speak up loudly for people's right to symbiosis, essentially, and that's that's what I've been pushing lately. You know, the very idea that you can make any plant, that you can criminalize any plant, is is absurd on the face of it. We really need to push back on that. We need to regulate these things minimally, if at all, regulate them as to quality and safety, but give people the right, essentially, to form symbiosis with any damn plant they want. It's a fundamental right, not even a fundamental human right. It's a fundamental organismic right, because there has to be a partner in a symbiosis that's not human. And, well, uh, and we should 
I want to see this discussed more and this this right asserted. Uh, you know, there is no such thing. I mean, how can a plant be criminal? <laughs> you yeah. know, that that plant. Uh, there's this idea that stuck with me uh, from an Australian researcher called Desmond Manderson, um, and he wrote about um, uh, about the 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 sort of the the crime of possessing a drug. Uh, and I think uh, I'll have to find the research piece and drop it in. I think it was called, it was something linking witchcraft and uh, talking about how there's, there's similarities uh, in our prohibition legislation in the idea of possession, even in that word possession, um, mm -hmm. as to there were in, in 1600s uh, America and England and uh, against the, 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 uh, the so-called witches. Uh, so he, he, Desmond was saying that... Um, Essentially, the law is seeing the drugs themselves as an animated force, as a as something that has a will, has a, p right. a particular morality. Um, when, like you say, it's not the it's not the drugs that are bad. Sometimes people use them in bad ways, uh, and sometimes people are bad people. <laughs> that happens too. Yeah. And and there are bad people. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think, you know, this is the main misperception that has made conversations, intelligent conversations about psychedelics difficult if you're talking to people that have never experienced one, you know, have never had a psychedelic experience. You know, I, I think uh, uh, there is this, all the focus is on the drug. You know, the drug is a demon or a pathogen, or the drug has some kind of autonomy. No, it has none of that. It's simply a plant. It has molecules in it. It has the properties that they have. It's all about how they're used. And Isn't it but funny? you know his his comparison of possession to you know uh, demonic possession in, yeah. back in the Middle Ages. It's it's very apt in some ways, but it, it's inaccurate. You know. People do these things, not the plants. The plants are happy to be what they are, you know. And and if 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 primates, if if monkeys want to meddle with them, then that's fine too, you know, because the plants can, you know, through these molecules, which are essentially messengers, you know, uh, it, it benefits the plant to form a symbiosis with something that will uh, another species that will take care of it, spread it around, propagate it, uh, and benefit from it. And this is what we're seeing now on a global scale with things like ayahuasca, cannabis as well. I mean, you know, we, we can all think back to a time not long ago when cannabis was as vilified and feared as psychedelics, mm. you know, and then it turned out, no, not only is it not that dangerous, I mean, it, anything can be misused, but it has tremendous beneficial uh, properties. The problem and the challenge for medicine, mainstream medicine, I think, if you're going to bring psychedelics into mainstream medicine, you cannot do it without revolutionizing psychiatry and revolutionizing biomedicine because you cannot use it, cannot use psychedelics in the therapeutically in the same way that something like an SSRI would be used you know a psychiatrist can prescribe an ssri doesn't have much effect in fact there's an abundance of data showing that you know it, it's actually much about as effective as placebo in a lot of ways but the model is you know you get the prescription you go home and the psychiatrist will say take two and call me in the morning I you see. can't do that with psychedelics you know, the therapist has got to spend a lot of time with the person to prepare them, help them through, be present for them during their their structured psychedelic experience, and then help them integrate afterwards. The uh, This is how you have to do it. So a therapist who's, you know, the time of a therapist is a big cost to medical medical uh, treatment, medical procedures. We have to change the economic model of medicine so that that can be supported. You know, the idea that a single therapist might, pen, might spend one or two or three days with a single patient, you know, to, to get them through it. So the medical model has got to change as well. 
Um, we're just about out of time, Dennis, but maybe uh, could you could you leave us with, um, let's get something nice and practical. Um, I, I work in, uh, in, in harm reduction. It's got that focus on harm. Benefit maximization is another way to put these things. But do you have any, uh, any tips you can leave uh, our YouTube uh, audience today on harm reduction around psychedelics slash uh, benefit maximization uh, to, you know, look, apart from set setting, those sorts of things, is there something uh, that you can leave us with today? Well, I think you just said it. I mean, I think the key is to maybe two or three things, if I had to tick them off, uh, tick them off, you know, approach psychedelics respectfully. These are, these are not, these uh, should not be used lightly. They should be used thoughtfully, you know, but that said, that doesn't necessarily preclude recreational use, but, you know, think about what kind of recreational use you want to do. I mean, being off in the woods and taking a psychedelic is very different than taking it on the freeway at 70 miles an hour. Don't do dumb stuff. I mean, I guess that's good advice, you know, just use common sense. The other thing is inform yourself about the medicine and, you know, why are you taking it? What is your expectations? This very important thing about set and setting, it's all about set and setting. That is very much more important in some ways than the medicine itself. I always like to plug arrowwood.org. It's uh, one of the best online resources about basically all psychoactive drugs, many psychoactive drugs, most of which I've never heard of and I could care less about. But as a source of, uh, of information about psychedelics, it's a very good place to start. So background it's yourself if, you're, if you've never taken a psychedelic or taken a, one you've never taken before. Do a little research at arrowwood.org. They have great trip reports and other things. So you go into it with a prepared mind. You know, you're, you're, you're deliberately, uh, you know, seeking a novel experience. And you can't guess what's going to go on, but you can go into it as, as, with as, enough, as much preparation as possible. So when the unexpected does come up, you know, it, it's not unexpected, essentially. You're more or less uh, ready to deal with it, even though it may knock you back on your heels. But, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, I knew it, I knew this was coming. So that's the thing. Information, uh, respect, thoughtfulness, educate yourself, and then go for it. Remember the real the real experience, the real te the the real psychedelic experience is what happens between you and the medicine. You know, it's an intensely individual experience, unique to every person. Nobody can have your psychedelic experience for you. You have to do it yourself. Wise words, Dennis. Thank you so much for joining us on uh, our. COVID styled uh, micro dose live stream here on EGA YouTube channel. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for having me. So I, I can go into the YouTube and uh, YouTube stream and watch a few presentations. That's right. And there's even right. there's a few more questions didn't get to get to uh, all the questions. But if you want to drop into the YouTube comments, uh, and uh, answer any of those questions, I'm sure uh, people would really, um, really appreciate that. Okay, I'll have a look. Yeah, I'll, if, I'll go to that if other link to. you gave. <laughs> Thank you so yeah, much, Dennis. Yeah, if I'm able to. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Have a great conference. <coughs> Lovely to see you again. Okay. I'm going to leave this <laughs> and go back to the other link. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>